For more than 120 years, the Zionist Organization of America has been the benchmark organization, fearlessly and tirelessly advocating for Israel's sovereign right to exist as a Jewish state on the land promised to us in the Bible and by international law. Through our Center for Law and Justice, our Government Relations Department in Washington, D.C., our ZOA Campus Department with a presence on more than 100 college campuses, and through our regional offices around the country, ZOA uses education to dispel myths and lies, to fight anti-Semitism, and to advocate for Israel, the only Jewish state in the world, the only democracy in the Middle East, and in our opinion, the best and most reliable ally the United States has ever had. <laughs> ZOA continues to bring the most relevant webinars featuring high profile guests from Israel, the United States, and from around the world, the greatest experts on Israel, Zionism, and Jewish advocacy. For information on upcoming programs, watch your emails from ZOA, follow us on social media, and visit our website, zoa.org, frequently, and we'll post information about imminent events in the Zoom chat during this program. It's always best to join us live, but if you miss a program, click the YouTube icon on top of our ZOA homepage. That will bring you to our YouTube channel where you'll find recordings of most of our webinars. And while you're visiting our webpage, <clears throat> please click on the donate button and support our work to the best of your ability. We need your financial support. Morton Klein has been the national president of the Zionist Organization of America for more than 25 years and is one of the leading Jewish activists in the United States today. <clears throat> Mort is a child of Holocaust survivors born in a displaced persons camp in Gunzburg, Germany. Mort worked in three US administrations, <clears throat> sorry, working in Washington, D.C. as an economist. He also served as a biostatistician at the UCLA School of Public Health and the Linus Pauling Institute of Science and Medicine in Palo Alto, California, having worked closely with two-time Nobel laureate Linus Pauling. Mort is the most fearless and outspoken Zionist and Jewish advocate, has testified before Congress, is often quoted in the media, and has appeared on any number of television and radio outlets. We are blessed and honored here at ZOA to work with one of the preeminent Zionists of our time. Here to introduce our speaker, ZOA National President, Mort Klein. Well, Alan, thank you for that really uh, very generous introduction. Uh, welcome to everyone. Thank you for being with us on this um, dreary Monday morning. Uh, the world, unfortunately, is not getting better. The problems continue to mount. Uh, especially when it comes to, to uh, U.S. Israel relations. And in early February, the ICC, the International uh, Criminal Court, wrongly and with great bias against Israel, wrongly determined that it has jurisdiction over Israeli actions in Judea, Samaria, and Gaza, even though never before have they ruled on an issue concerning disputed territories. For years, the PA has been pushing the ICC to investigate Israel for war crimes, even though it's the PA dictatorship that really is the one that commits war crimes by paying Arabs to murder Jews, by promoting violence against Jews in their schools, in their media, in their speeches, by naming school streets, sports teams, and children's camps after Jew killers, inspiring more violence against Jews. <laughs> in this case, the PA wrongly claims that Israel building in Judea and Samaria is a war crime even though Israel has not built, first of all, a new community since Oslo began in 93. Their building that has been done is within the existing boundaries of the existing communities, no new communities. Uh, they also claim the PA that Israel defending itself <clears throat> against Hamas terrorists trying to breach the border between Gaza and Israel is a war crime. <laughs> if they weren't trying to bre breach the border, Israel would not be forced to defend itself. <laughs> The ICC uh, has not gone after countries that really commit war crimes, not against Syria, Iran, China, Venezuela, uh, but on, uh, under international law as well, you have to be a state.
to request an investigation. And the investigated state has to be party to the Rome Statute, the ICC. <laughs> the US itself is not a party to the ICC. <laughs> and they claim publicly that the PA is not a state. Therefore, they can't request an investigation. The PA themselves say that statehood is their aspiration, that they are not a state. The Oslo Accords that the PA signed in 93 uh, says that they have no criminal jurisdiction and they have no territorial authorities. They're not a state. The right of self-determination, even if that right exists, does not afford statehood. The PA has no borders and there was never ever a state of Palestine to this minute. <laughs> International also says, if you're not a party of the ICC, you can't be investigated. Israel is not a party uh, of the ICC. And the ICC rule says, if the country has a robust judicial and military uh, justice system, <laughs> they can't investigate such a state. Any investigation has to be done by the country itself. And Israel has a very robust military and judicial uh, court system. ICC is a court of last resort for truly heinous crimes against humanity which of course Israel has never committed. <laughs> uh, previous officials and present officials from so many countries have said, this is wrong. The ICC has no rights. Countries, officials from the Netherlands, Italy, Uruguay, Canada, Spain, Ireland, US, UK, Australia, Brazil, Czech Republic, Germany, Hungary, even Uganda have publicly said the ICC has no legal jurisdiction over Israel, that this is simply a political tool that's being used. It is not, uh, appropriate legally. 300 House members, 69 senators have said this should not happen. And yet there's a new resolution in, in the Senate by Senator Cardin of uh, Maryland and Senator Portman of Ohio, uh, urging Secretary of State Blinken to do all it can to stop this investigation. It's illegal. They have no right to do this. Uh, I might add J Street, which calls itself pro-Israel all the time, has condemned Cardin and Portman for having this resolution uh, uh, urging uh, Secretary of State Blinken to stop this ICC investigation. More proof that J Street is anti-Israel, hostile to Israel uh, uh, in every way, shape and form. <laughs> this action by ICC is pure anti-Semitism. This is simply to demonize a Jewish state because it is a Jewish state. <laughs> and the proof is that they do not go after the real countries that really commit uh, 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 crimes against humanity, Syria, Iran, China, Venezuela. So we at COA will do all we can to urge Congress to strongly fight uh, to stop this from happening. This will be a political action and they'll come out with lies against Israel to further demonize it. We'll do all we can in the Senate. We're gonna work with Senator Cardin and Senator Portman and with the Biden administration do all we can to make sure that this illegal, inappropriate, uh, anti-Semitic act does not happen. <laughs> now it's my special pleasure to introduce our distinguished guest today, uh, uh, attorney Yifa Siegel. She's, she, was, she is director of the International Legal Forum dedicated to global, global cooperation between lawyers, organizations, activists from all over the world. She provide this uh, group provides uh, knowledge, strategic planning, research, and international network needed to different organizations to fight radical ideologies, to fight terrorism, to fight BDS. She was formerly the joint director of the extraordinary uh, Tazbit Press Service, which disseminates news reports and footage from Israel to media outlets throughout the world. She has a graduate degree in international relations from Tel Aviv University. She has a law degree from University of Haifa. We are honored to have such a distinguished legal expert as Yifa Siegel at our ZOA webinar. webinar. Attorney Yifa Siegel, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you so much, Mort. Thank you for inviting me to join you. Uh, this is a real honor. And uh, well, this is a very, very important subject. Um, a lot of what we do, um, you know, the legal battles for Israel, for justice, for the Jewish people are all very important, but this, I think is, is, is a crucial time for all of us to understand what we're dealing with and, and really come together and fight. And I want to first thank the ZOA for everything that you that your organization is doing and you more is doing personally uh, for this specific purpose and for other purposes as well. So thank you very much. And uh, <clears throat> so let me make a short introduction. There's a lot to say about 
this issue of the ICC. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna make a short introduction and then please feel free to ask anything you want. So I wanna start by giving you a little bit of background. So why would the Jewish people, why would the Jewish state, why would we even oppose uh, an international cr criminal court? Why would the state of Israel not join the Rome's treaty to begin with? That's a very, very, <laughs> That's a very, very big uh, uh, question, I think. And if you if you know the history a little bit, then you would know that it was actually Jews who kind of pushed for this idea to to kind of you know come into life. It was the model. The idea was was you know the Nuremberg trials after uh, uh, the Holocaust. And what we wanted, what we, of course, collectively uh, uh, speaking, what the Jews wanted, what a lot of people wanted, was was a place. Uh, a court of law, an international court of law that will do justice, that will overlook, you know, political considerations and, and power struggles and will take on, you know, the worst cr war criminals, the worst people in the world, uh, regimes that are rogue and evil and, 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 and murderous. And, and, and there will be some place in the world to fight against, uh, against them. Unfortunately, as the Rome Treaty, which is the treaty that brought that established the, the International Criminal Court as it developed slowly but surely the state of Israel and so did a lot of Jewish experts and lawyers around the world started to understand that this court will not be that dream. We will not see that dream coming true. That court, you know, what is what is coming to life is actually um, a, a political entity that is, is that that there was a great concern that will actually not target, you know, the the worst criminals in the world, but actually, uh, uh, you know, smaller countries or, or, or anything that will be politically motivated, you know, might be targeted by this court unjust, uh, unrightfully. And I think what happened last month proved that point exactly. And I think this is exactly why the United States of America haven't joined the Rome Treaty, and this is exactly why the State of Israel have not joined uh, uh, the Rome Treaty. And we saw it happening right before our eyes last month when the International Criminal Court decided to go after the State of Israel for alleged war crimes. And let me tell you why I think this is the absolute proof, and this goes beyond the fact, uh, uh, you know, these facts that Mort mentioned, that you know, the court is not going after you know, the worst countries in the world. They're not going after Iran and they're not going after the Assad regime, even after he uh, killed his own people with sarin gas and other atrocities that, that were committed in Syria. So I, as a lawyer, you know, we, we came together, you know, many, many lawyers that specialize in international law to think, what is our role? What can we? What role can we play in defending Israel? And in, and in, in, you know, before the decision about jurisdiction took place, place last month. And so over a year ago, we came together and we decided that although the state of Israel will not officially be representing itself, we as friends of the court, we as international experts, we will submit what is called an amicus, a friends of the court briefing or submission to, to lay out the legal arguments in front of the court. So they will have no excuse, but to kind of understand everything that they need to understand to reject the jurisdiction of the court over this uh, situation. So let me tell you, and, and, and I'm usually very modest, but I think what we have created was, was remarkable. They, the, we, any objective legal analysis of, of, of the court's ability to apply jurisdiction over the situation in, in Palestine would have been rejected, no question about it. And you know, you wanna know how I know this? The reason that I know this is because when the decision came out last month, the majority's decision, by the way, was two judges opposing one dissenting uh, 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 judge, Hungarian judge. So what they've written basically in their majority opinion was, International law doesn't matter. The Oslo Accords doesn't matter. Other precedents in the world does not matter. Nothing at all that a court of law is meant to be taken seriously, meaning the law does not matter. We will uh, uh, assert our jurisdiction over the situation in Palestine because this is what we've decided that is just or fair or basically this is what we want to do and you can't stop us. So it's- what is against? 
so I think this goes to prove that if they had, you know, if they thought seriously about their role as 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 the gatekeepers of international law, the gatekeepers of the rule of law. They should have, at the very least, explained and, and analyzed why every single one of our arguments does not apply to this case. They've completely ignored, completely ignored every single one of the legal arguments that, that the pro, let's say, everyone who has submitted in favor of Israel, which means, if I'm not mistaken, about 14 civil submissions by various experts around the world, which uh, 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 together was dozens of experts. It's, it's seven countries, like Mort said, including Germany and Austria and Canada and Australia and other countries as well, and, and other international uh, law experts for, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, from around the world. And they've ignored the whole thing, basically saying, we rely on a resolution that was adopted by the general, United Nations General Assembly. In other words, we rely on a political decision that has absolutely no legal standing in, uh, in international law because uh, um, United Nations General Assembly resolutions are not legally binding and this is not disputed. This is a, a fact in international relations and international law. And so we will rely on that. We will rely on a technical issue, the fact that the Palestinians were allowed to be admitted as, uh, uh, to the treaty even though the treaty itself is open uh, uh, to anyone who is a member of General of, of the United Nations. And the last thing, which I thought was the most dangerous thing that they've written in their decision, basically saying Palestinians have the right to self-determination, therefore they have a right to a state, therefore they have a right to a predetermined to a state which is predetermined in a territory which they will claim for themselves. That's basically what they've been saying. So why is that so dangerous? And I'll tell you why, because every single country in the world, if you if you look at any single country in the world, you'll see that there are minority groups in that country. Right, there are religious minority, ethnic minority, national minorities, um, you name it, they have it. In Europe alone, you have hundreds, hundreds of, of groups that, that are minority groups within the European countries. And so every single one of those groups have the right to self-determination. For example, I, I, we brought as, a, as, a, as an example, a case in Canada when Quebec wanted to separate from the, uh, from the state of Canada. And they also argued for the uh, right of self-determination. The Basques in Spain also have the right to self-determination. The Irish have the right to self-determination. The Bavarian region in Germany, which wants to separate from Germany, have the right to self-determination. It goes on and on and on and on and on. Bottom line, the right to self-determination does not equal statehood and does not equal sovereignty. So if the, the International Criminal Court wants to establish the Palestinian right uh, uh, to statehood on the right to self-determination, they're completely and totally changing international law in a way that is really, really dangerous. Because the message that they're sending out to the world is, you have the right to pick up arms and you have the right to blow up buses and you have the right to enter into civilian houses and murder children in their sleep, and you have the right to determine the borders of, of your non-existing country and that all depends on your right to self-determination. This is the message that the International Criminal, Criminal Court has really sent to the world. And I think if you ask my opinion, this is one of the reasons, if not the reason, for why all these countries all of a sudden stood up in, in defense of Israel or, or stood up opposing the ICC's decision because they see the danger that, that, this, this, that this decision poses to them, to, to, to their own territorial integrity, to their own states, to the, to, to the peace in their own regions around the world. And so this is, this is basically the message, politics over law, no rule of law, completely um, uh, overriding and overlooking any principle of international law. Another thing is international agreements, that doesn't matter, right? I mean, if the state of Israel and the Palestinian Liberation Organization, the PLO, 
have signed the Oslo Accords, it doesn't matter that you know every uh, uh, that, that so many countries are signing testament to it. It doesn't matter that the leaders got the Nobel Prize for it. It doesn't matter that the agreements are still valid. It doesn't matter what we think about them. They actually you know, the life within you know that especially the area C, area A, area B. The very existence of the Palestinian Authority is is based on the also Accords. So the court, the the ICC is saying. It doesn't matter that there is an agreement. We're completely going to allow you to ignore agreements when it doesn't suit you. And this is the message that the ICC is sending to the world. We allow you to be a bad actor. We allow you to ignore an agreement whenever that doesn't suit you. Okay. And and we're just gonna and it's just gonna be okay, you know, for us if that suits our political agenda, which is basically the bottom line. Okay. So I think, well, there, as I said, there's a lot more to say about it, uh, this decision by the ICC, but I think this is basically the gist of it. I'll just finish by telling you that the dissenting opinion, the minority opinion uh, uh, by that one judge is 166 pages of a legal analysis. And that judge takes into account every single, or I don't know, not every single one, but m many of our arguments. And every single time he kind of addresses one of our arguments, he's saying, you know, this is completely outrageous. He's basically saying to the other two judges, you know, what you're doing is dangerous. What you're doing is not, is, is not law. What you're doing is politics. What you're doing is dangerous. So if anyone is, you know, ever has a, a free couple of hours, I suggest you read that, uh, that minority opinion because I think it's, it's very interesting. And I think there's uh, some hope in that minority opinion, you know, to see uh, some truth or some justice in in that uh, in that horrible establishment um, as they've proven themselves to be. Dan, I'm to you. Thank you so much, Ifa. Uh, this was really amazing. Uh, a lot of information. Uh, but said in a very simple way and also a very ideological and Zionist way, the way we like things. Uh, Mart, if you have any questions, I'd like to give you uh, the opportunity to ask the questions first. Yes, first of all, thank you so much for that excellent presentation, Advocate Sigal. Uh, I think people would be interested, what are the implications, God forbid, that this uh, uh, investigation happens and they find Israel, falsely find Israel guilty of some human rights crime? What's the implications for Israeli leaders, Israeli officials, Israeli citizens as they travel throughout the world? What does this really mean if this uh, goes through and uh, they, they come up with a phony guilty verdict? Well, um, I think this is a horrible day in history because I think this is a day in history where, you know, we have to stand as accused by the International Criminal Court. So I think, you know, some damage has already been done. But you know the the next step. The question is: Will the ICC issue arrest warrants, and uh, or will they hold off with the arrest warrants until if and when they actually come out with uh, you know a, a, a ruling against any one of these Israeli figures that they might actually decide to prosecute? Um, let me tell you the good news. The good news is that there's a long way to go. I think. And the good news is that I think a lot of countries, as I said, a lot of countries and a lot of people, even if they're sympathetic to the Palestinian cause, they understand what happened here. They understand that this is a complete and total, you know, distortion of international law and, and the dangers that it imposes. So I don't know. So I think each and every one of us needs to continue the fight <laughs> to expose why this is uh, 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 why this is a, such a bad decision, and we should, and every single one of us can influence the fact that you know we will not come a day when when there will be an arrest warrant, and even if there will be an arrest warrant, no country in the world will actually honor it by uh, uh, extraditing an Israeli official into the hands of the ICC. So th these are the dangers: Ex uh, arrest warrants, extradition, incarceration, and sanctions at the end of the day. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Uh, we, we have a, a similar question. Maybe you can, uh, you can uh, speak to, you said it in, a, in, a, in short, but maybe you can expand. 
uh, from Gregory Lewis, uh, if the ICC were to issue an arrest warrant, who actually enforces it? Well, the, the, the countries that are members to the, to the ICC, to the Rome Treaty, are the ones who are enforcing it. So, uh, so basically, let's say there is an arrest warrant tomorrow against an Israeli. So they, you know, they will try to ask Israel to extradite that person. I assume Israel will say no. <laughs> Um, no doubt about it. And then they will go to the, you know, to the countries that are members of the ICC and say, if that person ever steps uh, on your soil, then you need to arrest that person and extradite that person to Israel. And, you know, th there were precedents in the past where countries actually did not abide by these, uh, you know, these requests and these arrest warrants, even Jordan. Uh, and not a while, a while, uh, when was this, a year ago, two years ago, declined to, to, to honor one of these arrest warrants that came out of the ICC. Um, so it depends on the cooperations of the, of the different countries. Thank you. Uh, David Leibowitz asks, uh, who funds the ICC and who pays the salaries of the judges and the staff of the ICC? Mm -hmm. So the, the, the countries who are members to the, uh, to the ICC actually pay uh, a, a yearly fee that funds the budget of the ICC. Um, you know, like every international organization, there are countries that carry more, more of the burden than countries that carry little to no of the burden. So let's say Germany, for example, is, I think, is the number one funder of, of, of the ICC, which is also why I think it's, uh, you know, there's reason to put more pressure on Germany, because Germany, as we said, Germany has already opposed, Germany has submitted against the jurisdiction of the ICC, you know, before this decision, and Germany then said they opposed the decision when, once it came out. But we should not allow them to settle for words. We should continue to put pressure on the German government to do more than just talk. Thank you. Uh, Carl Go uh, Goldberg asks, uh, can the ICC find Israel as a country guilty, or is it only individuals that can be found <laughs> guilty? <laughs> Yes, it's uh, it, it, it's uh, it's individuals. It's uh, it's not about uh, um, the the states. It's about the individuals that are you know guilty or not guilty of crimes. Uh, we had a few questions. The one from Arthur we uh, Weingenfeld about the Israeli response to the ICC, uh, and uh, I wanted to ask you uh, if you can maybe. Uh, elaborate on that because I know Israel didn't respond, but you did as an organization, maybe you can elaborate on that. So the, the, the state of Israel had to, had to decide what, you know, what its strategy, because the, the fact that the state of Israel is not a member to the Rome Treaty should have, you know, excluded, you know, jurisdiction and, and that should have been the end of that. Uh, but the court decided to go ahead and open a preliminary investigation, which is what we, uh, what happened until now. We're still, by the way, we're still at that stage because the new prosecutor would now have to decide to officially kind of launch the, the investigation. So anyway, uh, during those years, I mean, what, what, what is it now? Over 10 years, I think. No, it's less than 10 years, but it's since 2014. Um, you know, the state of Israel sh needed to basically make a decision. Does it continue to say, I mean, this is not legitimate. Your jurisdiction is not legitimate. We're not playing ball. We're not going to legitimize your investigation. We're not going to legitimize anything that you do. Or the state of Israel was to, you know, could have decided to, to, to uh, cooperate and to provide information and to, and, and, and to be, uh, uh, you know, more responsive to the court. The problem with that alternative would have been that, you know, it could have kind of opened the door on jurisdiction uh, and kind of bypass the fact that Israel is not a party to the uh, Rome Treaty or to legitimize basically uh, what we all thought was going to be a bad decision regardless of, of, of Israel's cooperation. So the, the decision was made not to cooperate. 
And I think, again, I mean, we, we had an argument, a very heated argument over the years between myself and, and many of the experts and lawyers and people that are involved in this. And people said, cooperate. I mean, cooperate, it's a court of law. If you cooperate with them, if you show them the evidence, if you expose them to the truth, they will come out with the right decision. And I think now that we read the decision, the majority decision, which is like 50 pages of nothing, basically saying international law does not matter, like I said. I think we now, you know, we can all kind of unanimously come to the conclusion and agree on the fact that there is no point in cooperating with the sport. Thank you. Uh, several countries, including Canada and the UK, have criticized the ICC decision to claim jurisdiction while re reiterating uh, their support for the institution. Uh, does this do any good? I mean, uh, to, to condemn this specific decision while supporting the institution. What should the US ask of other countries who are staying as members of the ICC? And I'll add also, what can Americans in general do to help fight this? Well, um, well, it's, it's a very good question. I mean, is it, is it lip service? Um, I don't know. I mean, your guess is as good as mine. I, I, I will tell you that, uh, when these countries first made their submission uh, um, at the end of 2019, I think it was, um, you know, it, it was a real legal analysis. They actually sat down, they made a decision, they sat down to write, a, you know, an analysis, a legal a, a submission, and they submitted to the submitted it to the court. They had, I believe, they had their an, a real intention of influencing uh, uh, the, the decision of the court. The, now it's 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 a question of what how far will they go to actually say you know you know we're not we're not going to cooperate with a court of law that completely disregards the rule of law or or law international law and i don't think they i, I don't i don't think i don't personally think that uh, you know they have a good enough reason to do that unless we put pressure on them to do that and i think putting pressure on them can include the American government pressuring its allies in, 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 in Europe to pressure the, you know, the ICC. And not only in the Israeli context, I mean, the United States of America is facing a very similar problem with the International court, uh, uh, Criminal Court. Um, so, so, so that's one thing. And I think, as I said in the beginning, every single one of us can write to, the, to these governments or, or can make a lot of noise of the fact that you know this is really really dangerous i'm not kidding this is not like something that i'm trying to say just to scare people i mean this is this this can literally be the start of of, of civil wars all over the world because if you tell the irish for example that you know hey guys i mean this is your independence day because the international criminal court said that you have the right to self-determination you can do anything you want congratulations um, um then just imagine how many separatist groups how many violent groups, how many minority groups can, can, can now pick up arms and start wars all over the world. And that's one thing. And again, as I said in the beginning, if, the, if international law now says, you know, agreements me, it, are meaningless, then just imagine, you know, what, can what kind of chaos can start all over the world because, you know, we can just pick and choose when we're gonna respect the agreements that we sign. So, you know, yeah, write something, do something. Every single one of us. Uh, one, another question, uh, Albert Hershkowitz asked, who are the two judges who ruled for and what is their nationality? And do you think it influenced their decision? I don't know if there's any uh, uh, meaning to uh, uh, their nationality necessarily. I mean, maybe there is, but you know, if, if you look at the prosecutor, right? So the, the, the prosecutor is, is, is from Gambia for Africa. And she was the attorney general uh, in a time where that country was very, very far from being a, a democracy, right? So, I mean, they've arrested and really did horrific things to political adversaries uh, while she was in, in that role. So, you know, I don't know, but I, I don't know if that necessarily, if that necessarily matters where they're coming from, but, uh, you know, I think we should definitely attack their, you know, their intentions, let's say, at the very least their intentions. Uh, Hugh Kitson asked uh, if you think there's a chance uh, that a group of member nations 
uh, might bring uh, about a prosecution against Hamas for war crimes. Uh, I mean, if this is a, a territory that can be judged by the ICC, then it makes a lot of sense. Why don't they uh, check uh, the Palestinian war crimes also? Well, they can check the Palestinian war crimes, um, but uh, who cares, really? Like, let me ask you something, who cares? Like Hamas, Hamas is a designated terrorist organization. I mean, all over the world, all over the Western world. There's, I, I, don't, I can't think of a Western uh, country that didn't designate Hamas as a terrorist organization. That means that you, either way, you can't, uh, uh, you, I mean, you, there, there's no money that can be, you know, given to Hamas or a political acknowledgement. Uh, the leaders of Hamas can't travel abroad because they are, they are already uh, at risk of being arrested for, you know, uh, crimes and terrorism and, 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 and stuff like that. So, you know, there's a reason why Ismail Aniyah is sitting in Gaza celebrating you know, the, this decision to, uh, uh, to extend that jurisdiction. There's a reason why they're congratulating, you know, the International Criminal Court. I mean, that, if, if that doesn't tell you how, you know, uh, this crazy the situation is, I don't know what will. Uh, can, you, can you take a small overlook of what the specific claims of war crimes are being made? This is Eric Burke that is asking. <laughs> Uh, yes and no, because it's we're not there yet. I mean, the 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 at this stage, the prosecutor's office was meant to kind of look into uh, generally, like if there's any um, possibility of ever proving there was a war crime. So they haven't launched an official investigation. There isn't a, a specific indictment yet. No, no specific crimes were were kind of, 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 of detailed yet. But what they are talking about are, are mainly two things. One is the protective edge, uh, the summer of, of, of 2014. And, and, and they in their review, they're pointing out a few possible war crimes, alleged war crimes that, you know, based on the Palestinian um, um, complaints to the ICC uh, were supposedly committed there. And the second crime, which is, of course, the most horrible crime you can ever commit, which is to build a Jewish house in, uh, on a piece of land that other people say is, is theirs. And so this is obviously the worst, most heinous crime you can ever do is actually build a, a house or, or a balcony or a kindergarten or a school or a hospital in, in, on a land that someone else says is, is, is theirs. And, and so this is the second uh, uh, war crime uh, uh, that they're going to look, uh, um, that they're going to look at. They've, they've, they've said that very explicitly. Uh, how broad of a consensus is this fight against the ICC within Israel? I I don't know if there was ever anything you know that we agreed on more than 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 this. Which <laughs> you know there there are a few radical uh, organizations that we know and you know are funded by the European Union and, and, and others. Uh, but I think the vast majority really like, it's, it's, it's really marginal, like marginal to, to who cares, uh, uh, you know, the people who kind of disagrees with this. Thank you so much, Ifa. Uh, I know that you're very busy these days uh, and I'm very happy that you took some time uh, in order to speak to us. It was very important for us to have this emergency meeting once we heard about the decision so that our, our members stay updated. Uh, I'd like to call on Mort uh, to say uh, uh, closing remarks. Uh, well, uh, Advocate uh, Sigal, Yifa, thank you so much for a really an enlightening uh, uh, explication of the ICC. Uh, this is the type of situation that Jews have had to endure throughout history, unfortunately. <laughs> You've helped us to understand better what the problems are and how uh, we Jews have to continue to fight for what's right for our people and fight against uh, oppression, lies, bigotry, and hatred of Jews, irrational hatred of Jews. I hope it's okay for me to also congratulate you <laughs> for your new post. You'll be coming to America. Uh, I'm so honored and proud to state that you'll be the chief of staff to the outstanding new Israel ambassador to the U.S., Gilad Erdan. You'll be his chief of staff working in Washington. And after uh, uh, listening to uh, this afternoon, uh, he is very lucky to have you. And we as Jews who care about Israel are very lucky that you will be lending your skills, your eloquence uh, to fighting for our people and 
uh, working hard to maintain strong U.S. Israel relations. So thank you so much. We look very much forward to seeing you in Washington or New York or wherever uh, we may uh, meet in the very near future. Thank you again, Yifa Sigal. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And uh, if anyone wants, uh, we've written reports and analysis, and there are, are a few points that we have raised in a, in a document, not for lawyers. If someone wants to make arguments and they want to further understand, feel free to ask. I'll, I'll, Don, I'll send you everything I have and they can access it. Great. Thank you so much uh, again. Uh, I just want to remind everyone that this is one of uh, our uh, many Zoom webinars that we've been doing since the start of COVID and I will keep on doing it uh, for the time uh, uh, in, the in the next few months. There's one coming up uh, this Sunday, which is the fourth part that was, uh, that was uh, instituted out of popular demand. Uh, we were planning three parts for our Judea and Samaria virtual mega event, but out of popular demand, uh, we're, uh, we're having a fourth part and you can already register uh, it's going to happen on March 7th, uh, and it will be on defense issues, uh, security issues that have to do with Judea and Samaria. Uh, we will have there MK Naftali Bennett, who's former Minister of Defense, uh, MK Tzvi Hauser, the Chairman of the Foreign Affairs uh, and Defense Committee, uh, and uh, the Brigadier General Amir Avivi, who's the founder and CEO of Habitronisti, and many other fascinating speakers. Uh, it's a free event, but you must register. And I also want to remind everyone here that if you support ZOA and if you like the content that we bring you and all of the things that we do, then please feel free to donate. You can find out how to donate on our website. Uh, and thank you very much for coming here today. <laughs>